Over the years, Zelda games have come a long way from where they started. As a franchise grows, however, some entries emerge as fan favourites while others are lost to the sands of time. In a world where we have games like Ocarina of Time and Breath of the Wild which are beloved by the Zelda community, it's often easy to overlook the lesser known chapters in the life of the series. A prime example of this is The Minish Cap, a game that was received very positively but was equally only experienced by a relatively small player base. This was most likely due to the time period in which it was released. Minish Cap came out in November of 2004 for the Game Boy Advance, which was the very same month that the Nintendo DS first saw the light of day. You see the issue here? While this was an unfortunate way to start off its life, you would be mistaken in thinking that this game isn't up to scratch with its counterparts. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that it's one of the best. I'm Fiber Optic Broadbean, and this is why I love The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap. The thing that sticks out to me most about Minish Cap is its art style. The game takes a top-down perspective, but does so in a unique way that blends the cartoony look of Wind Waker with the bird's eye view of traditional Zelda games. It just looks really pretty, the sprite work is great and lends itself nicely to the less realistic style of Wind Waker. Everything just looks so colourful and bright, which makes exploring the overworld an absolute delight. As we've come to expect from Zelda games, Minish Cap is also really solid in terms of its gameplay. The dungeons, the combat, the puzzles, they're all exceptional. But what specifically sets Minish Cap apart from the pack? Well, first and foremost, you've got the game's main mechanic, which allows Link to shrink down to the size of an ant and explore the world from this new perspective. This is a brilliant idea and is seamlessly integrated into the game in some really creative ways. When you're small, you're able to enter passageways and tiny areas that you wouldn't be able to access at full size. Inhabiting these areas are the Picori people, also known as the Minish, and these guys are so cute. I love how they make their homes and bedrooms within human houses and that they use leaves as blankets. It's really good attention to detail and helps to emphasise the sheer difference in scale between them and humans. A lot of thought went into incorporating them into the world, and it's done in a really endearing way, like how inside the cafe made for humans, the Minish have their own little cafe on the ceiling rafters. Another example of the sense of scale being used to great effect is when you're walking through this stormy area, you turn small and then even the tiny droplets of rain become dangerous to you. It's so cool to see everyday objects like acorns and buttons being these huge obstacles and platforms to navigate through. There are also a few combat applications as well. Take the Armos, for example, which appear to be statues, but start attacking you when you get close. At first, it seems like these guys are quite hard to defeat, and that is correct. However, what you can do is shrink down in size, which means that the Armos can't detect you, even if you walk right up to them. What this then allows you to do is climb into them and disable them from the inside, which I think is such an ingenious way of using the power. The way it's implemented into the temples is also fantastic, and the first one, being the Deepwood Shrine, sets a great standard for this. You complete the entirety of it while shrunk down, and this comes into play for a lot of different puzzles. For example, there's this one room with a barrel that you can walk around inside, which makes it roll around. This allows you to access different parts of the room, by going through various holes in the barrel which act as entrances and exits. Then there's the boss fight where you have to take on a choo-choo. Yep, just an ordinary choo-choo. The catch is that since you've now become tiny, a once weak choo-choo now appears giant and becomes an intimidating threat. You can't just kill it by hacking away at it with your sword as you would with any other enemy, oh no, that gets you nowhere. Instead, you've got to make good use of the dungeon's item, that being the Gust Jar. This item has a wide range of uses, including inhaling enemies and blowing out gusts of air. While this does seem pretty simple at first, it's often used really creatively, like when you're floating on a lily pad and you have to use gusts of air to push yourself along. The dungeon is also host to these stretchy mushrooms, which Link can pull on to launch himself across gaps. Later on, you'll find some of these on the other side of a gap that you need to cross, so here, you need to use the gust jar to suck the mushrooms towards yourself. As mentioned before, it's also used in the boss fight, where you have to use it to suck away at the base of the giant choo-choo to overbalance and topple it over, providing a window to attack. 
This isn't just limited to the Gust Jar though, as Minish Cap has such a wide variety of interesting items gathered over the course of the game. Another really unique one is the Cane of Pakai, which is used to fire a beam which… flips things over? I'll admit, this does sound rather unimpressive on paper, but trust me, this weapon has more utility than you'd think. It can be used on various enemies to weaken them significantly, or alternatively to upturn broken pots which then act as portals in the overworld to allow you to shrink down in size. Perhaps the strangest use is that when you fire the beam into these holes in the ground, it acts as kind of a springboard, launching you upwards. For a weapon that, on the surface, seems pretty straightforward, they actually manage to cram quite a bit of utility into it. The rock's cape is pretty neat as well, and allows Link to jump around a bit and even glide for a short amount of time. Some weapons can even be upgraded, like the boomerang, which becomes the magic boomerang. Rather than being thrown out in a straight line like its ordinary counterpart, its path can be somewhat controlled using the D-pad. This upgrade takes place after completing a side quest, where you have to find the four Tingle brothers scattered around Hyrule. The side quests in general are another thing that this game handles so well, although they work a bit differently when compared to other Zelda games. Here, they centre around these things called Kinstones, which are essentially halves of medallions that you find in chests, pots, and sometimes even when you cut grass. Different NPCs will have their own Kinstones, and if you have the corresponding halve to theirs, you can fuse them together. Fusing Kinstones can change aspects of the overworld, by introducing new enemies, spawning in treasure chests, or even opening up up previously blocked off areas. This goes a long way in helping the world to feel a lot more alive and dynamic. One particular side quest that comes to mind is where you have to assemble a full on squad of Gorons to dig out a massive tunnel to net yourself an empty bottle. A large proportion of these side quests take place in Hyrule Town, which really brings the place to life. Between the copious amount of NPCs to talk to and all of the tiny areas inhabited by the Minish, there's a lot going on here. It just feels so lively and colourful, and has a ton of buildings to explore, as well as a bustling outdoor market. As you get further into the game, more and more areas of the town will gradually open up to you, giving a nice sense of progression. First and foremost, you have the shop, which initially doesn't have that many items to buy. Over time, however, more and more items become stocked in, from capacity upgrades to a straight-up boomerang. Those aren't the only items you can obtain in the town, though. Far from it. At one point in the game, you reach the Castor Wilds, an area surrounded by swampy terrain that causes you to sink. To get across, you need a pair of Pegasus boots so you can gain enough speed, and this is where the Castle Town's very own Shoemaker comes into play. The only issue is that when you pay him a visit, he's asleep, taking a snooze. Luckily, you're able to shrink down and talk to some of the Minish living within the shop, and they give you directions to the Witch's Hut. There, you can buy a special mushroom, which is used for waking up people, apparently. <laughs> Once you use this on the shoemaker, he finally gets up and gives you the Pegasus boots as a token of his appreciation. I just love how in-depth this little subplot is, and Castletown is full to the brim of ideas like this. You've also got the flippers, which you get after navigating through the sewage system underneath the Hyrule Library, and the power bracelets, which are found within the fountain. As mentioned before, a lot of kinstone fusions occur here too, which help even further with the world building of Hyrule Town. One example that I particularly like can be found after you fuse kinstones with the postman. This inspires the guy working at the post office to start up a newsletter, and the further you progress into the game, the more issues that become available to you. These issues give you tips for fighting enemies, hints about some of the secret items like the magic boomerang I mentioned earlier, as well as a few personal touches from the author. Between all the buildings to explore, the secrets to uncover, and the characters to interact with, this has to be the single most fleshed out castle town across the entire Zelda franchise. Even outside of the town, the game has a lot of really neat characters, but for me, one of the best ones has to be the main villain of the game, Vati. Returning once more after his appearance in Four Swords, Vati is given a compelling backstory in this game. Essentially, he was once an ordinary Minish, but over time grew to become power-hungry, seeking knowledge about the evil in the hearts of men. He used to be the apprentice of an old Minish sage, but one day turned on his mentor and cursed him, turning him into a living hat. And that hat is the very same one that Link eventually comes to possess. This former sage-turned hat is known as Ezlo, and acts as your main companion throughout this game. Overall, I'd say that he serves this purpose really well. 
Between his intriguing backstory and charming personality, I really like this guy. He brings the sass and often chimes in with quips that always get a chuckle out of me. <laughs> it's like having a wisecracking, cranky grandpa with you for the whole game. Ezlo is also pretty handy to have around as well. Alongside the ability to make Link small, Ezlo can also help Link catch an updraft and fly around for a bit, a bit like the Deku Leaf in Wind Waker. He can even give you advice or hints at the push of a button, which is a neat feature considering that it's both helpful and pretty unobtrusive too, looking at you Fi. Aside from the abilities granted by Ezlo, there are a couple of other unique mechanics brought to the table by Minish Cap. One of these is the ability to create clones of yourself by charging your sword on these tiles on the ground. These clones are often used for dungeon and overworld puzzles, like moving large blocks and hitting multiple switches at the same time. In addition to this, the sword has quite a few other uses which are picked up along the way. In a few hidden, tucked away areas, you'll find these sword masters who'll teach you some really strong techniques. Some of them are fairly rudimentary, like the sword beam and spin attack, but a lot of them are more complex and add some spice to the combat. You've got the roll attack, which is a sliding stab you can perform after getting up from a roll, the dash attack, which lets you do a running stab using the pegasus boots, and even the down thrust. This one essentially acts as a ground pound, allowing you to slam down after jumping up with the rocks cape. I'm tempted to say that the coolest technique has to be the great spin attack though, which functions similarly to the Wind Waker hurricane spin by letting you move around while using the attack, which can be pretty devastating against enemies. The combat in this game is yet another one of its strongest aspects, and it all culminates in the final boss against Vati. It's a challenging battle, and has a few different phases which require you to use the items you've obtained throughout your journey really resourcefully. The first phase is Vati Reborn, where you have to dodge his laser beams and destroy the eyes that shield him. Later into the phase, these eyes will be protected by some kind of force field, which you have to suck in using the Gust Jar. Then you move on to the second phase, where Vati turns into a giant eyeball orbited by eight eyes. The catch is that only four are vulnerable to your sword, and to reveal this, you need to shoot the eyes with your bow. This then allows you to clone yourself into the correct formation and attack the four exposed eyes all at once. After that's done, you move on to the final and most powerful form, Vati's Wrath. Here, he gains some massive arms, which emerge from the ground to attack you. At first, it seems like you can't do any damage, but if you use the trusty old cane of Pakai I mentioned earlier in the video, you can flip the arms over, rendering them useless and exposing a small hole. Using a conveniently located portal, you can then shrink down to minish size, go into the arm, and destroy it from the inside, a bit like what you have to do with the Armos. Then, all you have to do is clone yourself four times, reflect four projectiles at once, hack and slash at Vati until he dies, and bingo. This is a long and really tough boss fight, but it's one that tests you on everything you've learned over your journey. To me, it feels like the perfect conclusion to this outstanding game. As far as 2D Zelda games and honestly just Zelda games in general go, Minish Cap is hugely underrated. It's a fairly short game and can be a tad on the easy side at times, but that doesn't make it any less sweet. In fact, I'd argue it's a good thing. The game doesn't drag on or outstay its welcome at all, but if the player desires, they can take the time to explore it to its full potential by completing the rich amount of side quests it has to offer. If you've never played this one before and are a fan of 2D Zelda games, it's definitely one to try out. I can't recommend it enough. It's just a bit of a shame that you don't really hear much about Minish Cap these days, but hey. Link's Awakening got a remake, so there's nothing stopping Minish Cap from getting one as well. After the oracles, that is. Who knows, maybe that would spark a resurgence in popularity for the game. My hope hasn't diminished yet. <laughs>